Pastor Ken. It is a blessing to be back with you. I don't know what it is you all do to us, but uh, whenever we're here, we feel really welcome. <laughs> you know, we travel a lot when we're stateside and we're in different churches almost every weekend. Um, but for some reason, we've gotten to know you all. <laughs> so it's always a blessing. And I was excited when Pastor Ken called and uh, said, uh, would you be interested in sharing one Sunday morning? And I thought, well, yeah, sure, great. And he says, how about talking about the Holy Spirit? And I'm kind of going, <laughs> anything but that. It was, it's a terrifying subject, and I, I really have to uh, compliment your staff that they're willing to delve into that because it is one of the most misunderstood and often misrepresented members of the body of Christ, the body of the Trinity, the, the headship of the Father. Now, it's not right for us to single out just one of them and look only at them because uh, they are representative of God. Okay, all the members are representative of God. But uh, we've chosen the subject this morning because of Pastor Ken's suggestion, the practice uh, practicing the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I want to be really practical. Uh, like I said, it's one of those subjects that's kind of scary. Uh, but as I studied and prepared for this, I, I said to my wife on the drive down from my task of this morning, I said, you know, sometimes I think we uh, conservative Christians need a good boot in the pants about the activities of the Holy Spirit. So uh, she says, you need to say that this morning. <laughs> so there's the message from uh, Pastor Mimi for you this morning. Uh, we do, we need a boot in the pants because it's one of the subjects we avoid and yet it is the representation of God in us as he indwells us. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, believe in him as your Lord and Savior this morning, he indwells you. He's right there with you all the time. Why does he get such low billing? So I want to start this morning, uh, you know, I was going to name this thing something different. I was going to call it uh, the Holy Spirit for Dummies. You know, you know the books you see in the bookstore. Unfortunately, uh, my uh, pastor Mimi over there says, you know, people might not appreciate that. <laughs> but just realize, if I make an accusation this morning, I'm right there with you. All right? So if there's something uncomfortable, I, you're not alone. I struggle with the same thing. So uh, be aware of that. I want us to take, start out by looking into 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, you can certainly look them up. I'm working out of the ESV this morning. Uh, not sure which version you usually use, but I'm using the ESV. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 16. And this is somewhat of a devotional to get our hearts turning and thinking about what the Holy Spirit ought to be in you and I. Verse 12 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world. It's really hard not to get steamrolled by the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might understand, and I've got that in red, understand, the things freely given us by God. Because of the Holy Spirit that indwells us, we are able to understand the things of God. And it goes on. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Interesting. You don't need to go to college to learn this. You need to spend some time in the presence of the Holy Spirit to learn the things of God from his word. All right, that's our foundation. But it comes from God. And we impart these words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ this morning and claiming as your Lord and Savior, you are a spiritual person. Enough said? You are a spiritual person. And because of that relationship, you are able to interpret spiritual truths. That's what we're doing here this morning. We are going to interpret some spiritual truths 
and try to apply them to our lives so that we might live differently. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. It's only in that they are spiritually discerned are they significant, and the natural person doesn't have that. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Why? Because the things that he discerns, he receives through the Spirit from God. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And that's how we are able to discern. Let's pray. Father God, as we look into your word this morning, we ask that you be our teacher and our guide. Might everything that I have planned fall by the wayside in exchange for that which you have prepared for each of us and each of our hearts this morning. May your name be praised and honored. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I chose this passage because it describes the way things are supposed to be between us and the Holy Spirit. And I want us to get down honest about what the Holy Spirit is supposed to be in our lives. And at the end of the day, what difference does the Spirit make for you and I? How does he change us? Are you changed? Let me guess. In reality, I'm going to guess that most of us give less than 1% of our day to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Am I wrong? <laughs> we can communicate. <laughs> Am I wrong? Less than 1%. I mean, even if you have an hour of devotions in the morning, that's only 1 24th of your day that you are practicing the presence, the cognitive realization that the Spirit is in you. And that's my definition, is that the practicing the presence of the Holy Spirit is cognitively living as though he is here in my head, here in my heart, and on my shoulder watching and uh, talking to me. That's the one we're going to get into this morning, the dialogue with the Holy Spirit. My interest in this subject started... It didn't start with Pastor Ken's call. I'd been studying this for some time. It had happened after I had uh, did a study of the Sermon on the Mount out of Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Now, the guys who were with me at Camp Lebanon heard this story already, but they're going to hear it again because <laughs> it's worth telling. All of these wonderful teachings of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount practically speaking, probably many of the Jews who were present, it went right over their heads. And it says, and this is where I got hung up in chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. It says, when Jesus had finished saying these, uh, saying, these sayings, excuse me, the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Why? For he was teaching them as one with authority, not as their scribes. What impacted them was the mode by which he taught. He taught with authority. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He was present in Jesus. He was God with us. Of course, the mode in which he spoke, spoke tons, even if the content of his lessons did not impact them, they saw something in him. They would leave home, forget to bring food, leave at the wrong time of day, and go to follow Jesus. And he ended up having to feed them because there was something about him. The presence of God was in him. And they were curious. Who is this person? Because he was the perfect presence of God among us. But he wasn't the only one <laughs> who had the presence. You know, Paul would show up in a village or a town where God had called him, and he would come and people would say, what do you have to share with us? Come to the Areopagus. Come, speak to us. Tell us what you have to share. What was it 
about Paul that made people want to hear what he said? Was he that great a communicator? <laughs> uh, I suspect, other than his run-on sentences in the Scripture, I suspect he was a good communicator. But there was something more about him that attracted people to him. How about Barnabas? When he was sent by the Jerusalem Council, the, uh, the elders in Jerusalem, to go to Antioch, he was to go there and discover, because they had heard that the Holy Spirit had come upon Gentiles. Heaven forbid. Now, this wasn't the first time it happened when Peter also did this. The Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. And at this point, they send him up to check this out. And he gets there, and he is able to discern in Acts 11.23, it says that he saw the grace of God in them. What was it he saw in these people? How was he able to discern the Holy Spirit in them? What was it he saw? But it goes on to say, interestingly enough, it said that Barnabas himself was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Therefore, Barnabas was able to interpret spiritually spiritual things. He was able to see them and interpret them. So there's things that happen when the Spirit is in you. What would it look like, let me ask, and let's, this is an honest question, what would it look like for you and I if we had the presence of God in us to the level that Jesus did? Boy, that almost sounds blasphemous to ask that question. How about even just the presence of God that Paul had? Or maybe Barnabas had? What would be possible for you and I if we had that level? Watch out, here comes the sermon spoiler. <laughs> Here's the sermon spoiler. You do! <laughs> you have the presence of the Holy Spirit indwelling you right now. Here comes the real question, though. Why don't you and I have the same impact on people around us that the great men and women of faith have had down through the years? Why do we not have the same impact that Jesus had when the Holy Spirit indwells us, who is a member of the Trinity, who is God living inside of you? Why do I not have that same impact? That's the real question. That is the real question, and it's one that I've been asking myself for some time. In ministries, and here's my solution, <laughs> in ministries, I've noticed some other things about how the Holy Spirit shows up and how the Holy Spirit does not show up. It's kind of like, you know, in Aslan, in the Narnia Chronicles, the youngest Pevensey girl is told by one of the forest creatures, he said, you know, he's not a tame lion. Well, the more I got into the study of the Holy Spirit, I'm discovering he's not a tame spirit either. <laughs> He's not there at your beck and call. There are things he does, and there are things he does not do because of the attributes that he's chosen for himself. As a missionary for 38 years, actually it's coming up on 39, I guess. We're getting close to 40 years, anyhow. Uh, I've watched and noted that oftentimes our best missionaries and our best pastors are not always our best missionaries <laughs> and our best pastors. It sounds really odd, I'm sure. But there are some people who serve the Lord out of the strength of personality, education, charisma that they have. And you watch them, and they serve. And I'm, their hearts are certainly into serving. But the impact on a spiritual level is oftentimes lacking. The last country in which we've been serving, uh, we met a woman there. <laughs> you know, I worked on staff uh, for our mission for a number of years as well, and one of the things that I would do is sort of make evaluations and how people are doing. And as a staff person, if I had met this woman before, quand elle a parlé en français, elle a parlé comme une américaine. Her her French pronunciation was awful. <laughs> And uh, there were a lot of things about her. She was uh, 
always wore, you know, as a nurse, you always wore uh, long skirts, never slacks, never, very, very conservative. And yet the people around her believed she could walk on water. Never a disparaging word from her mouth. In spite of some of the turmoil that was going on around her, she never had a bad word for anyone. There was something about that woman that was different. She had the presence of the Holy Spirit in her life. We had, uh, as I think I've talked to you before, if you recall, we ran the program called Journey Corps in Cote d'Ivoire. And we'd have young adults come from Germany and the United States and would go and live in Ivoirian homes. And they would arrive in these homes and not speak any, any French. And they would arrive and they'd go into a Muslim home and they'd practice a little bit of their French and so forth. At the end of one year, uh, Mimi went to pick up one of these girls and the entire village came out to try to convince her not to take her away. Her French was awful. Her abilities to communicate were awful. But the presence of the Holy Spirit in the girl's life drew out the entire Muslim community and the family that she lived with who were believers had an opportunity because of what was going on in that girl's life. There was a presence of the Holy Spirit. All believers have him, but the vast majority of believers live their entire lives with liter literally no recognition of the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Scripture tells us a lot about the Holy Spirit's attributes. Uh, just after listing the, some of the incredible gifts that he has for us in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it says, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit. Now he's talking about the giftings that are available to us. All the, these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. In other words, the Spirit apportions to me my gifting and empowers it according to his will. How much do you think he's going to apportion to my gifting and empower it if I only give him 1% of my day? You think he's going to feel all warm and fuzzy for me? <laughs> and want to empower and do wonderful things in people's lives through empowering the gifts? I suspect not. One of the things we forget about the Holy Spirit is that he's a person. He's a person of the Trinity. He has personal traits. Now in seminary, this kind of got kicked out of me because you know the noun form of the word pneuma is neuter. So you kind of think of him as, a, you know, there's the he, she, he, the spirit is it. But yet scripture regularly delegates to the spirit emotional things. He has knowledge in 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. He has a mind in Romans 8, 27. So he thinks, he's got a mind. He has love. In Romans 15, 30, it's an emotion. Love is a huge emotion. He can be grieved in Ephesians 4, 30. He searches the things of God in 1 Corinthians 2, 10. And he can be insulted in Hebrews uh, 10, 29. And the list goes on. If you read uh, some of the attributes of the Holy Spirit, the list of who he is brings life to the personage of the Holy Spirit. The same personage of the Holy Spirit that was evident in Jesus and is evident in the Father exists also in the Holy Spirit. So when I give him 1% of my daily time in worship and in cognitive thought that he's present in me, how do you think he feels? I think he would feel grieved. He has a personality a lot like us. So we have our devos in the morning, 
and I appreciated it, every, you know, no self-respecting young, young adult calls them devotions. <laughs> they are devos. <laughs> Put it into your vocabulary bank if you've got any gray hair. Uh, we have devos in the morning, and we say amen, and we start our day. After lunchtime, we, uh, well, this is what I did in high school, you know, uh, nobody looking, bow my head, scratch my eyebrows, uh, rubber dub dub, bless the grub, uh, is, what, is the prayer that he got out of me. And then at dinner, I had to be a little bit more respectful, you know, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, let this food to us be blessed. Amen. Dig in. <laughs> uh, bedtime. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. If I should live another day, I pray the Lord to guide my way. God bless mother, dad, the dog. Amen. <laughs> uh, that was the extent, although being a believer, that was the extent of my practicing the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. All told, we don't give him his due. Now this isn't only just because you and I are at fault in this. We as generally conservative, uh, theologically people, we sometimes avoid the Holy Spirit, as I mentioned before, because we're afraid of some of the misrepresentation and the misuse of the Holy Spirit and its gifts. His gifts, excuse me, not its gifts. Uh, we, we kind of avoid it. But also in Scripture, there's 26 times in the New Testament that the three persons of the Trinity appear together in one passage. So we see them together, and we respect that, but when it comes to the epistles, neither Paul, Peter, James, John, or Jude include in their um, opening remarks, in their uh, welcome uh, in their epistles to the, the churches, they do not include the Holy Spirit. I greet you in the name of the Father and Jesus Christ, or the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Uh, different ways of saying it. It's almost the same formula every time, but the Holy Spirit is lacking. So we kind of put, it on the, put the Holy Spirit on the back burner. Let me tell you, who is it that lives in you? Thank you. <laughs> we can communicate. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. Now the assumption is, is that God and Jesus are in heaven. So when they wrote the greetings to the churches, they did not need to mention the Holy Spirit because he exists in us, in those people of those churches. Didn't need to be mentioned. But unfortunately, it makes it look like he gets low billing. He is an equal member of the Trinity. He indwells his believers. Now here's a really loaded question. How many of you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in your lives? Okay. 24-7? You know he's there, but how many of you cognitively live as though he was there? That cognition that says he's in my head, he's in my heart, and he's parked right here on my shoulder. It's not easy to live that way. Um, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is our seal of redemption. Now that is a one-time fixed event, no matter how much of the attention you give him, give him, but our walk with the Spirit's presence takes a ton of work. Uh, to sense his presence, we need to work with him. Remember, he has a personality and certainly doesn't want to be ignored. Now, let me drop a bombshell on you here. It's probably easier for you to come to church, to give a tithe, to serve, possibly even to the levels of leadership, than it is to practice the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because that takes a cognitive choice to walk with him all day long. And it's not an easy choice to make. You have to decide it and work at it. I'm not talking about some strange, irrational lifestyle either. 
uh, that's the thing we want to avoid when we start to speak about the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about you inviting him moment by moment into the thought process of your daily life. Let me be honest, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> yeah, anytime I point the finger, you know this, there's, there's three pointing back at me. <laughs> um, I'm right there with you. My goal is to uh, make sure you understand the importance of it. But I've started down a road to practicing the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life every day. First of all, these are practical. These are downright practical, okay? I remind myself daily in my devotions, in my, excuse me, Avery, my de devos, <laughs> in my devos, that he is there and in me all day long. I make it a daily profession of faith that he is there with me all day long, and I'm going to remember him. I'm not going to forget him. Secondly, I don't say amen at the end of my devos. Because, well, it's supposed to mean so be it, that you're making a declaration. For me, it's become a, it's over, done praying, finished, did my task, let's get on with the day. So I don't say any men anymore. As a tripwire in me to remind me to live all day long as though he is there in me, listening a part of my life. Here's one that may make you a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> it's out there on the edge. I expect him to talk to me. Not only do I talk to him, I listen, and he talks to me. Now, do I hear something audibly? No. Now, I'm not going to get into real depth on this one, but he does speak to us. It's not just me either. John 16:13. Mark 13.11, Acts 13.2 says he does and will talk to us. Maybe not audibly, but he conveys the mind of God to us. So as I practice his presence, when I talk to him, I get the impressions right back that he's saying this to me and this to me. Now, this is dangerous because sometimes I have trouble discerning the difference between my thoughts and his. And I certainly don't want to make that mistake. But consider this. Read those passages. Uh, pick up the recording and get those passages. Secondly, I set up tripwires in my life that jog me back into the presence of the Holy Spirit. Every time I use my keys, got a whole ring of them here somewhere. Every time I reach in there and grab these, I remind myself, oh, yeah, Holy Spirit, how you doing? <laughs> You're there, aren't you? You're there. And I'm remembering to cognitively relate to him. Every time I stick one of these in the ignition of the car, I cognitively remember. Uh, second thing I do is every time a person passes me on the road, now I must be getting old because people are passing me a lot more often than they used to. As younger, I used to pass all of them. But as people pass me today, maybe it's the gray hair setting in, uh, I remember, oh, yeah, Holy Spirit, I should be praying for people who have to drive like that. <laughs> I'm not sure how you took that because it drew laughter. <laughs> but the object is I'm practicing saying, Holy Spirit, how should... I treat this. I'm asking you for guidance. I'm expecting a response. Another tripwire is certain people and certain subjects trip me. And these days, highly political things trip me into going to the Holy Spirit. Uh, Spirit, help me hear what I ought to be hearing. In all the turmoil that's out and about us, Spirit, I know you're there. Touch my heart with what your heart is and teach me to follow what your heart is because you are bringing it to me directly from the Father. I want that. That brings me back into his presence. It makes me succumb to his direction and guidance because he's there. It's a tripwire. 
And there are certain people who grate on me like fingernails on a chalkboard. <laughs> it still makes me cringe. When that happens, those are the people I ask the Spirit to give me guidance on. And I practice the presence. Now, there are some things, as you learn a little bit more about practicing the presence of the Holy Spirit, that will change you. It can be scary because the more time you spend cognitively walking with him all day long, he's going to change you. There are some things you will notice as you increase the presence of the Spirit in your life. And I told Pastor Ken I was going to make this downright um, practical. So here are some of the practical things I've learned about walking in the Spirit. First of all, it gets really hard to sin. <laughs> when he's parked right there on your shoulder, it's really hard to cognitively do something that you know is wrong for you to do because it asks you to make an act of rebellion. How many of you in the face of Jesus would do an active response of rebellion against something he has taught. Well, it's the same thing when you practice the Spirit of God in you. It's an act of rebellion if you sin. Boy, it makes it really uncomfortable sometimes. Gentlemen, when you sign on the Internet, that site... Are you going to do an active... Uh, Re act of rebellion? Because you know he's right there with you. You are actively saying, don't look. <laughs> I could go on. There's, uh, you women have your things too. Uh, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, all of these things, it's hard to do them incorrectly when he's with us. Secondly, things that you're going to change, not only in, uh, finding it hard to sin, you will thirst for alone time with him. Some would call it prayer, but uh, it isn't one-sided, it's two-sided. You're going to want to closet yourself with him even more. It's easy after you get into it. One hour is not enough. More and more you're going to be drawn into his presence. Thirdly, you won't decide anything without recognizing the part of the Holy Spirit, that the, par the part that the Holy Spirit should play in it. Purchases, how you react to people, how you live, where you live, the car you drive, he should have a say in all of those things as you're about doing them. You talk to him, you ask him questions, and he responds to you. You will want other believers to commune with the Spirit the way that you commune with the Spirit. And fifthly, you will become more outspoken with the gospel because he will give you the opportunities to use the giftings that he's empowering. If you spend time with him, he's going to empower those giftings more and you're going to want to share the gospel. So what was the passage we started with? Now we have not received the Spirit of this world but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Isn't that what we're doing this morning? We're interpreting spiritual truths for those who are spiritual. Will we create appreciation in the Holy Spirit by living our lives full-time in his presence? Will we seek the presence, his presence, so he will empower the gifts that he's given us? Will we seek to have dialogue with him? But it takes you and I making a cognitive choice to live as though he's right here in your heart, right here in your mind, and right there on your shoulder. You're willing to take on the task of living in his presence? Let's pray. Father God, just like we pray to Jesus and to you, O oh Lord, 
we want to remember the part that the Holy Spirit plays for us as our comforter, as the one that you gave us to care for us and to watch out for us. Lord, teach us to live as though he's there, that he is in us, so that your name will be honored in all that we say and do because of his presence. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.